Hello and welcome dear friends. Let's move on in understanding some of the methods of gene transfer during gene cloning. Today I would like to discuss two very important gene transfer methods namely the chemical transformation which is similar to Griffith's transformation which we have seen in your earlier semesters and the second is electroporation the use of electricity to insert a DNA inside a cell. As we have been seeing various methods of gene cloning we come to a stage a juncture where the introduction of the cloned DNA as you can see here in the figure this plasmid which is containing your gene of interest has to be inserted inside the host cell. Now this itself is a tedious and a somewhat artistic task for the genetic engineer just like a surgeon's surgery and then the sutures are very important just like that. Introduction of this designed gene which should not only be inserted inside a host cell but also ensure that this remains stable in the host till the end of your expression of that gene. So various techniques are there. These two are not the only standalone techniques. Many methods are there but pertaining to your syllabus we will be seeing two very important techniques the chemical transformation method and the electroporation. Now before venturing into these artificial techniques let's just see how or from where did this idea come from. There is a natural method in the bacteria where across the species they transfer their genetic material and that is called as a horizontal gene transfer. Even if you talk about conjugation or, or transformation or transduction this is these are classical natural methods of horizontal gene transfer. For example if you take a antibiotic resistance phenomenon it is not that only one bacteria has a antibiotic resistance it is able to transform its antibiotic resistance character across the similar cells of that colony growing in a plate let us say or in a broth it is able to transfer that resistance factor across the cells. How is this made possible? Maybe if these are Escherichia coli cells they have attached themselves to each other with the help of pili and they have formed a biofilm and then by a horizontal gene transfer method like conjugation rolling circle mechanism they transfer that gene which is responsible for the resistance of the antibiotic. Now this horizontal gene transfer method is the movement of the genetic materials between the organisms. Horizontal gene transfer it plays a very important role in evolution and it is one of the prime mechanisms by which bacteria they have got various features like antibiotic resistance is there <coughs> then uh, resistance to virulence is there etc. So this particular method of horizontal gene transfer has been studied by scientists which has been occurring naturally naturally in the form of uh, conjugation transfection uh, transformation transduction has been artificially bought in the form of transfection by the scientists the introduction of foreign dna or rna inside a cell this is one step <coughs> which is again and again encountered during the recombinant dna technologies means we have a host and for example a plasmid or a viral dna which is containing your gene of interest has to be employed to insert it inside a host. Now the host will keep your gene of interest intact and not only that much it will be expressing your gene of interest. So this introduction of foreign DNA or RNA into a bacteria or even eukaryotic systems is a very common technique which is encountered in the molecular biology and scientific research. So there are various ways by which this gene of interest or the foreign DNA can be in introduced into the cell and as I just said by transformation, transduction or conjugation which are the natural methods, natural ways by which a bacteria does this can be employed to do it in vitro or in laboratory. So transformation, transduction and conjugation they occur naturally but they can be used uh, in a process where artificial method uh, uh, 
what you can say is uh, uh, modification of this methods can be used and one such modification is transfection so let's take a look about two such important methods which i just mentioned for gene transfer that is the chemical transformation method or we can call it as the artificial transformation method and electroporation <coughs> so first see the uh, the artificial transformation where you can see here any bacteria which takes a plasmid which is containing your gene of interest it becomes a transformed cell okay a plasmid which is introduced into into a bacteria is a transformed cell now the main glitch or the main problem here in this method is that this plasmid is containing your gene of interest and this is not a natural transformation where we believe in competence a phenomenon where the cell uptakes the dna transformation is the uptake of genetic material from the environment by the bacterial cells in a particular phase of life cycle in a that is at the end of log phase and the beginning of stationary phase we have seen that the bacteria they become competent means for a short duration of time by a large population of bacteria or for a large duration of time by a small population of bacteria they become competent which means that their cell wall as you can see here in this picture becomes porous or it becomes permeable to the extracellular dna the point of interest is that for the scientists or the hypothetical curiosity which we can say was that can we create a bacteria in such a state a competent state or a artificially porous state where it can uptake the dna in artificial conditions fortunately they succeeded and it is now today possible to uh, promote the gene of interest containing extra chromosomal material inside the host cell by artificial transformation <coughs> now various factors they promote the natural transformation as you know uh, in the growth cells uh, gro growth factor as i just said competence is a factor in the growth phase of a cell which is responsible though all bacteria they are not naturally competent try to understand natural competence is not a property of each and every bacteria though it is across multiple uh, species but not all but by this artificial transformation process all the bacteria they can be made to uptake the dna they can be made permeable to foreign dna their cell wall can be made permeable they can be made competent through chemical manipulations in the laboratory now this is a process which employs calcium chloride which perme permeabilizes the cell membrane okay the cell main membrane becomes artificially permeable and the bacteria can easily easily uptake your foreign dna or the gene of interest <coughs> so this artificial transformation is creating a artificially competent bacteria which can accept the extra chromosomal dna or the plasmid or the naked dna from the environment the generation of competent cells i repeat again can be done or can occur by two methods one is the natural competence and the other is artificial competence natural competence is the genetic ability of the bacteria to receive environmental dna under natural conditions or if it is artificial in vitro conditions okay now bacteria can also be made competent which is the main point of interest in this lecture by artificial method using a chemical treatment method chemical and physical both are used that is there is a temperature shift in this technique whereas even a chemical in the form of calcium chloride is also used <coughs> this is based upon the principle of 1928's griffith's discovery of natural transformation and natural competence artificial competence you should remember that is not encoded in any genes whereas the natural competition uh, competence is encoded in genes this is a very important point to be uh, understood that and this is one of the main reasons why each and every bacterial cell even if it is not naturally competent can be made competent using this technique <coughs> in laboratory the a procedure used where cells are passively made permeable and the conditions are all unnatural for the cell so there may be a question of viability of the cell does the cell survive 
how so how long it will survive whether after the transformation takes place will there be a further cell division or not these points are very important and it depends upon the fineness of the process the art of the process which is being used i'll come to that point but remember that the procedure of artificial competence which is used basically is very simple is very easy and can be used to engineer a bacterium it is as simple as you have to suspend the cells in calcium chloride and carry out the process but here one point has to be understood that the transformation efficiency by this process is very low because only a portion of the cells they become competent and they are able to successfully uptake the dna as you can see competent cells they create adhesion zone or pore like structures and this is the cell membrane which is made up of phospholipid bilayer now this phospholipid bilayer the phosphates which are there on the outer they are negatively charged and the dna is also neg negatively charged therefore there is a hydrophilic type of re repulsion by the cell there is a hydrophilic type of nature of the dna which repels in the negative negative conditions which makes it very difficult to introduce inside in inside a host in natural conditions so we have artificial method as you can see the preparation of competent cells by calcium chloride treatment technique is very simple a bacterial cell is taken and it is introduced into a test tube which contains uh, one to five millimolar of calcium chloride and in this the cell wall it becomes permeable as you can see this is an intact cell wall and the cell wall becomes permeable and this plasmid can be introduced inside the bacterial cell once the bacteria gets the uh, plasmids with the gene of interest it is called as a transformed bacterial cell which can be selected on the basis of plating techniques on the contrary natural transformation pathways in gram negative and gram positive bacteria they are different and this makes it very specific not all though majority however a majority of the bacteria they have natural competence factors and natural transformation phenomenon they show but still it is not 100% across all the species <laughs> but by this method you can 100% create a transformant cells of, for any species so this is a natural transformation the same which you have seen in the griffiths experiment so i'll not waste my time elaborating the natural transformation pathway which you should know as a basis for understanding this artificial transformation so what is the principle of artificial transformation as you can see there is outside of the cell wall there is a inside of a cell wall outside and inside of the cell wall or the cell membrane they are negatively charged outside is also negatively charged inside is also negatively charged by the phospholipid bilayer arrangement now this dna which is going to get entered inside this cell wall is highly hydrophilic in nature and normally it cannot pass through the cell membrane due to the large amount of negative charge which it possesses so negative negative it basically repels so in order to make this bacteria uptake the dna you have to make it competent what is competent competent is a phenomenon where the cell wall becomes temporarily or in controlled conditions as long as you want becomes permeable to the foreign dna so this can be achieved by creating adhesion zones or small pores in the cell wall or the bacterial cells by suspending them into a solution containing high concentration of calcium or calcium chloride now this is the principle where see this figure this dna which is negatively charged from the outside and the cell wall or the cell membrane is also negatively charged so this dna in this phospholipid bilayer is not permeable but when you introduce a chemical modification it creates pores number 2 you can see here number 1 this is a different type of pore where the dna is introduced inside it is similarly like this here a pore where the dna comes inside so extra chromosomal dna this will be forced to enter into the cell by incubating these competent cells and the dna together now this only is not sufficient only the dna and the cells will be incubated is not sufficient there is a brief time where you have to give heat shocks and cold shocks okay so uh, it is done on ice 
followed by a brief heat treatment which causes the bacteria to suddenly uptake the DNA. Uptaking means the outside DNA enters inside the cell. Naked DNA molecules they get bound to the uh, lipopolysaccharide layer whereas the attachment is there and if competent cells are there they are forced inside. If it is a uh, naked DNA and no competent cells they will just remain attached onto the uh, lipopolysaccharide layer. Here the divalent cations they generate a coordination complex with the negatively charged DNA molecule and the lipopolysaccharide layer. This figure as you can see here DNA first if you see the divalent cations they will generate a sort of attachment a coordination complex between the negatively charged DNA and the lipopolysaccharide layer and DNA as it is a larger molecule it cannot cross the cell membrane or enter the cytosol by itself. It has to be uh, processed or it has to be made to force to enter and that is done by this method where the heat shock and cold shock is used. As you can see up to 42 degrees centigrade the temperature is raised and suddenly the temperature is brought down to 0 degree centigrade. So this is heat shock and this is cold shock. What happens when you employ a heat shock and a cold shock? that also forms the principle of the DNA uptake by artificial calcium chloride transformation. The heat shock it deeply or strongly depolarizes the cell membrane of the calcium chloride treated cells. There is depolarization and the membrane potential decreases. This lowers the negativity of the cells inside potential. Okay, negativity of the inside potential is lowered down. All the calcium ions they will attach to the negatively charged phospholipid layer and this heat shock it will depolarize the cell membrane then the membrane potential is decreased the movement what will happen with the DNA which is negatively charged it allows the movement of the negatively charged DNA inside the cell once it is attached and the movement starts there is a subsequent cold shock given means suddenly the temperature is brought down to 0 degree centigrade what happens here when the temperature is brought to 0 degree centigrade? This rises or raises the membrane potential. In the earlier just few minutes back the heat shock was there, temperature was raised. So what has happened there? There was a lowering of the negativity of the cells inside means decrease in the membrane potential was there. Now when the temperature is brought down there is increase in the membrane potential and Due to this suddenly the DNA is sucked inside, the DNA is bought inside. Again I will repeat this explanation in a stepwise manner when we will see how stepwise it is carried out. There are two disadvantages of this process. One is bacteria they no longer become stable when they possess holes. If the bacterial cell wall they are having holes then you cannot uh, give any viability of the binary fission or the cell division of the bacteria. If there are more holes they may die easily. So it is very uh, fine technique, uh, artistic technique for how long the cells have to be sub suspended, what should be the concentration of the calcium chloride. All these determine the permeability and the viability, permeability of the DNA and the viability of the cell. So here also one second important point of disadvantage which has to be noted is that a poorly performed procedure means if the technician is not good if he is not skillful then he may uh, he may not only kill the bacteria but if he is able to survive the bacteria there won't be many competent cells in the culture so this is a fine artistic technique which has to be uh, expertized with practice now the same principle I will just tell you in a stepwise fashion how the artificial calcium chloride transformation is brought about. See this is the first picture where a negatively charged DNA in the, in the test tube, this all is taken in a test tube, plasmids are added, calcium chloride solution is added and the naked DNA or the plasmid containing DNA is added. So even though if the addition zones or the holes they are physically large enough to admit small DNA molecules the negatively charged phosphates on the DNA. Why the DNA is having negative charge? Because it is a, it has phosphate, there is sugar phosphate backbone. This phosphate and its negative charge on the DNA helicase 
helical structure are the ones which repel these lipid molecules okay so the cell membrane itself is made up of li negative lipid molecules and these phosphates repel the negatively charged dna helix and they do not allow the uh, adsorption and entry of the dna first part second so what you do what you do is you add calcium ions calcium ions from the calcium chloride they form a calcium chloride dna complex and the ions they interact with the negatively charged uh, cell membrane creating a electrostatically neutral solution which will allow the adsorption of the calcium DNA complex inside the cell so there is a negative charge okay plus a calcium plus positive charge a electrostatically neutral charge is there once this electrical neutrality is achieved the next uh, game is by heat shock that is cold shock and heat shock and the DNA is absorbed inside the cell so as you can see this calcium plus ions these are attached to the DNA negatively charged DNA as well as to the top outside surface of the cell wall now what you do is you lower the temperature which congeals the lipid membrane means which hardens the lipid membrane and hardening of the lipid member membrane stabilizes the negative uh, phosphate molecules which are always in a sort of motion they are just stabilized and this makes it easier for the DNA to enter inside the pore so first you just lower down the temperature a cold shock is there and then cold shock heat shock and cold shock this process lowering the temperature hardens the lipid membrane it becomes a bit hard you know what happens when you keep a butter inside the refrigerator it becomes hard so lipid molecules they are fat molecules in the low temperature they will become hard hardening or congealing it's it's called as and in this context with the electro uh, static neutrality or the stability being achieved the dna then it f enters inside the pore now suddenly the temperature is increased to 42 degrees centigrade a rapid increase in the temperature or the heat shock it causes a temperature imbalance on the outside and the inside inside it's still low outside it is high high temperature outside and low temperature inside it sets up a current difference potential difference and with the ionic shield in place what is the ionic shield the hardened lipid layer on the top is the ionic shield it is intact the dna can easily enter inside the cell cell wall okay it permeates inside the cell wall this is the basic technique and the process of calcium chloride transformation which is used for the introduction of foreign DNA inside the cell. Now let us see the second method which is electroporation. Now this employs electric current. I hope you have understood the chemical transformation. Now this is a physical transformation. The, these two methods have been chosen for your curriculum because of its uniqueness in the uh, or the diversity of the approach one is chemical this is physical so let's see what is electroporation so electroporation is a technique where we use electric currents instead of a chemical or any other method of relying on natural abilities we introduce a electric current where the electric charge increases the cell membrane's permeability and thus the transformation efficiency this has been used by scientists for, for various methods so this is a diagram of a basic circuit setup of the electroporation apparatus as you can see here so you have switches a resistor a voltage source for a continuous generation of electricity a capacitor and a beaker or cells containing dna and other molecule here instead of beaker you will be having cuvettes this is a specially designed electrophoretic cuvet the in uh, electrophoresh electroporation the most important component is the electroporetic cuvette this has a lid cuvet and inside the electrodes there are inside the cuvette there are electrodes as you can see in this picture here if possible see this these are the cuvettes i hope it's visible to you so this is a lid inside of the cuvet these are small cuvettes which is of around some five to six centimeters in length and some around one to two centimeter wide as small as that the cells can be 
placed inside a solution solution can be placed inside this cuvette the cuvette on the two sides they are having electrodes it is a now you can see the three types of cuvettes here which have three different types of sample uh, volumes so this is one which is having large sample volume small cuvette and a still smaller cuvette depending upon the need whereas the outside dimensions they are same inside it is engineered in such a fashion that it will hold different amounts of liquids so on this in this inside when you pour the sample which is containing bacteria your gene of interest or the plasmid which has to be inserted etc on the either sides of the walls there are two electrodes once you place it inside it will be automatically attached to the positive and negative terminals and a continuous supply of electric current will be ensured what happens under the influence of this electric current is what we are interested in seeing in the electroporation technique so there are specially designed electroporetic cuvettes as you can see here the green part on the two sides they are connected to a power supply these are the electrodes and the electric contacts are achieved means this green is present in the instrument and this blue part it is present inside the cuvette so when you insert the cuvette they come in contact and a flow of electricity is ensured and this inside yellow color is the cells in suspension so electroporation is a very important technique where there is a significant increase in the electrical conductivity of the cell membrane okay so what happens when there is a increased electrical conductivity there is a increased permeability the cell walls they become permeable in many cases electroporation is used to introduce a foreign dna or a rna or a plasmid into the bacterial cells and carry out the artificial type of transformation now the background of this is almost similar to that of the chemical transformation the phospholipid bilayer of the plasma membrane this is hydrophilic in its exterior and hydrophobic in its interior so any polar molecules like dna protein uh, rna etc they are unable to pass through this non polar hydrophobic fatty acid tails they, they are unable to pass the barriers okay so many methods have been developed to surpass this barrier and allow the insertion of the foreign dna molecule inside the cells we have just seen one technique that is the calcium chloride transformation technique the another method which is used and which employs electricity is electroporation so this electroporation let me give you some information regarding it again it is used to introduce a bacteria uh, dna inside a bacteria the bacteria is the host a very important part of your recombinant dna technology or the molecular cloning and the method this method is called as artificial transformation and it is a very important step in construction of recombinant dna strains which will carry out your gene expression very recently electroporation or it is also called as electropermeabilization electropermeabilization or erect electroporation is a method in which a brief period of time for a brief time high voltage electric discharge is used which creates permeability in the cell wall which renders the cell wall permeable to dna and this method has revolutionized the transformation of bacteria transformation process of bacteria this technique is very fast it is very simple reliable reproducible and it frequently gives a very high transformation efficiency as compared to the chemical transformation where i had mentioned in the disadvantage that low transformants are arised this is applicable to a wide range of bacteria which are which were previously thought to be untransformable means if you have one bacterial cell which is not transformable by natural methods or chemical methods you can make it transformable by the electric method that is the electroporation now this technique also offers other advantages for uh, escherichia coli which is one of the most important tool for genetic engineers which can be studied separately so this electroporation how is it carried out it works by passing 
uh, some thousands of volts or around 8 kilo volts which is thousands of volts across the suspended cell in electroporotic cuvette. So this is the cells present in a cuvette. So pulse electrode through a power supply is applied and this creates pores or holes in the cell wall. Afterwards when the cells have to be uh, used for transformation they are kept inside such cuvettes here they are kept in cuvettes and the electricity is passed okay cells have to be handled very carefully because they they must divide okay they must divide and each divided cell must contain a plasmid not only the plasmid but that copy number of the plasmid which was chosen as the plasmid vector so this is a very careful technique because the cells may die due to over electroporation. Large number of holes if they are generated in the cell wall, the cell will not survive. So this process is basically 10 times more efficient than the chemical transformation method but it has to be done very skillfully. Electroporation or electropermeabilization, I define it once again as a, as a process which significantly increases the electrical conductivity and the permeability of the cell plasma membrane and this is caused by an externally applied electric field. Now we have seen the principle of electroporation that short pulses of high voltage current are applied to bacterial cells. Now this has been also used for skin cells, human cells. Injecting the DNA into the uh, that is gene therapy which we call it as in cancer. In the end I will talk about applications you will understand that. So short pulses of high voltage are applied to the bacterial cells or the skin cells of humans or the tumor cells. Wherever this electroporation has to be applied there some short pulses are produced and this introduces hydrophilic pores in like this hydrophilic pores in the lipid bilayer and these are very temporary so the DNA or the extracellular material like protein DNA RNA can be introduced inside. So the process procedure is as I already said this is the part where you keep the cuvette inside it and this is a circuit diagram where externally applied electric field introduces pores in the cell wall or the adhesion zones are created. Now this is again as I said real pictures of the cuvettes with the electrodes. These are electroporation cuvettes and you can see I have already explained this circuit diagram which is very important. So electroporator with a loaded cuvette you can see here and this has to be placed inside the uh, box which will provide the electricity for this Cuvettes. Now there are two types of electroporators. One is bench top electroporators, which I just said, cuvette holder plus a uh, voltage uh, assembly. Now another is handheld electroporators. There are some small differences in this. Generally, bench top electroporators they are used in the laboratory, and it is kept on a working bench. They offer the advantage of uh, giving electroporation or creating permeation in uh, multiple samples at the same time, multiple samples of bacterial suspension at the same time. They can also be set up to different operating parameters depending upon whether the cells, uh, they have a cell wall, they do not have a cell, cell wall. In many of the techniques where antibiotics are used, the cell wall is removed, removed and only the plasma membrane is also used for the experiments. So the bench top electroporators they offer a wide range of different operating parameters to be employed depending upon the various conditions of the experiment. On the contrary handheld electroporators they are portable in nature, they are cordless charged by the battery, they are rechargeable and they use disposable pipe electrodes, pipe pipe electrodes they are called as. This is a pipe electrode means this can be used for one method and they can be disposed of. Their operating parameters are preset. They do not offer a wide range and this pipe electrodes can be introduced directly into small uh, test tubes or the ependroff tubes which contains your samples. 
so these are also very effective and for a rapid method handheld electroporators can be used can be very handy this electroporation it works on the phenomenon by a physical method where as you can see here this is a real time picture of a cell membrane during pulsing this is a cell membrane before pulsing this is a cell membrane during pulsing and once the dna is introduced inside the cell membrane after pulsing it returns back to its original state so controlled millisecond electric pulses electric pulses in milliseconds they introduce temporary pores in the cell cell membrane and if done skillfully if the technician is very good then you can in the end have a bacterial cell membrane which remains unharmed intact as if nothing has happened the mechanism of the lipids in the hydrophobic core and their shrinking is just like this so this is the phenomenon of electroporation how it works <laughs> there are various advantages of this electroporation over chemical method electroporation is effective with nearly all cell and species types on this present on this earth it is very efficient large majority of the cells they they, they take up the target dna or the dna molecule in a study uh, the electro transformation of e coli it was found that escherichia coli 80% of the cells they received the foreign dna okay means of 100 cells were taken 80 cells already received the foreign dna such is the great efficiency of this electroporation technique the amount of dna required is very small as compared to the other methods so you don't have a wastage of your gene of interest here in this method and this process may also be performed in vivo means i will give you one example about gene therapy this method can be used to inject directly means this epidermal skin which is there this is also a layer which is made up of phospholipid bilayer and electroporation or electro injections can be give, given directly into the humans for that specific uh, gene targeting i will explain that so these are the advantages of electroporation there are certain disadvantages as you can see electric field which is applied usually it is reversible means once the dna is delivered you can as i just showed in the picture earlier the cell membrane becomes intact as if nothing has happened the pores will be uh, just uh, finished off I mean, there will be no pores at the end of the process okay but if this becomes irreversible means if it imbalances large electric potential is large or more duration of time is given the cell may die there can be a cell death cell damage if the pulses of the wrong length or the intensity wrong intensity time as well as the amount of electric current if the time is more or the voltage is more then some pores may become too large or they may fail to close after the membrane discharge and this may cause the cell to die damage or rupture so that is a, that is one disadvantage cell damage now non specific transport is one issue if your gene of interest containing solution where the plasmid plus the gene of interest is impure it is not pure in nature then the transport of other materials into the cell may take place okay means this may result into a ionic imbalance and uh, impor improper functioning of the cell may take place usually you have a solution which is made up of certain ph so that certain ph may introduce uh, in and out transport uh, of ions electropermeability which is relatively non specific may transport other ions also and this may result into a ion imbalance and could later uh, lead to improper cell functioning or death so these are the two disadvantages of electroporation this electroporation has wide applications in the molecular biology research and in medical field also some of the applications of electroporations i would like to mention here the first is dna transfection or dna transformation which is the main purpose of this uh, lecture so as you can see first here in the picture a floor if we have used fluorescent markers we in the sense the scientists they have used fluorescent markers for your gene of interest and introduced the gene of interest inside a uh, bacterial cell and later on by using fluorescence methods if we check whether this dna has really entered inside or not you can see fluorescent markers right here they show that the gene 
construct has entered 90% of the cells okay 90% so this is very efficient this is likely the most efficient and widespread method which is used electroporation because specific genes they can be introduced inside a plasmid and that plasmid can be introduced inside a host cell and uh, you can also investigate whether this has really come inside or not okay it can be used for genes dna rna proteins so on and so forth so as you can see in this picture here 90 percent efficiency is achieved by dna transfection using electroporation so this is the first method which we have discussed the second is direct transfer of plasmid between the cells between two cells you can directly transfer the plasmid bacterial cells which already contain a plasmid may be incubated with another bacteria which does not contain the plasmid uh, but has some desirable features this contains the plasmid you are interested only in the plasmid you have another bacteria which does not have the plasmid but has certain interesting features or desirable features so you think that if this had this plasmid now this is ideal host so this voltage of electroporation can create pores allowing some plasmids to exit one cell and enter into these cells by just keeping these two cells close to each other we can use this technique to transfer plasmid between cells okay the desired cells then they can be selected by using antibiotic uh, resistant or by plating techniques similar methods can be used and this type of transfer of the plasmids from one bacteria to another and then creating that as a host is uh, rapidly growing now in the molecular biology field this is very be becoming very popular and um, after all you can just use this and multiply the bacteria on the plates create colonies and use it for your further studies so the second application of electroporation is direct transfer of plasmid between two cells now transdermal drug delivery this is the medical application uh, we cross the boundaries of microbiology we go for a human benefit aspect beneficial aspects of mankind electroporation can deliver dna vaccines directly just as electroporation it causes temporary pores in the bacteria there are studies which suggest that similar pores can form in the lipid bilayer of our skin that is stratum corneum stratum corneum is the dead part of our skin the skin cells these pores could allow the drugs to pass through the skins to target a tissue this method of drug delivery which is used is more pleasant than injections okay it is very simple than injections which is painful does not require a needle and this could avoid the problems of uh, even when you take up uh, tablets and capsules there is problem of improper absorption or degradation of oral medications in the digestive system oral medications when you take in the digestive system the efficacy of the medicine can be lost sometimes with some patients so all this can be overcome by using transdermal drug delivery how it is done syringe and needle electrodes are inserted into selected muscle tissues and the dna vaccine is injected these wax these syringes are so small so micro in nature that uh, you don't even feel that it has been injected so these are injected into the muscle tissue and the dna vaccine is injected what happens here is that controlled millisecond electric pulses are applied to the needle electrode what is injected is a needle electrode and inside itself once injection has taken place you start the electric pulses and it forms an electric field then what happens the cell membrane which is there the trapped dna it enables the cell to produce antigen and uh, it controls the chronic and the carcinogenic cells which are there even diseases like hiv the hiv cells can be targeted here and the antigen can also trigger any antibody production to prevent diseases so you can see the electric field what happens when this is uh, injected and electric fields are created inside electric field creates temporary openings in the cell membrane allowing significantly greater amounts of dna vaccine to enter directly inside the cell so injection is given it is not muscular then electric field is applied you can think about a handheld electroporator a portable electroporator injected and there itself the electricity is put on and this dna 
is then introduced inside the cells. The cells will multiply, they will secrete antibodies and the disease will be taken care of. This is a very promising uh, area of research right now in the medical and pharmaceutical microbiology. The last two applications are cancer tumor electrochemotherapy means the scientists they are nowadays exploiting the potentials of electroporation to increase the efficiency of chemotherapy in cancer. Chemotherapy is use of chemical drugs. Okay, as a electroporation process for DNA transfection, the applied electric field this would disrupt the cancerous cells. Means it is injected, electric fields are applied that will disrupt the tumor cell and it will also increase the amount of drug which is delivered to the site. Means efficacy or the efficiency will be more. Some of the studies they have suggested that increased tumor reduction means there is a huge amount of tumor reduced. The significant amount of reduction in the tumor size is seen when this method is applied to the cancerous cells. In, uh, in animals okay in the laboratory test animals as I said again these last three applications they are going out at the research level and in the near future very promising results have allowed it to come in the near future in the market the last is gene therapy which is the most studied and researched area in medical microbiology much like drug delivery as I have shown in point number three just like drug delivery, electroporation techniques, it allows vectors containing important genes to be transported across the skin and the target tissues. As you can see, a gene DNA molecule, plasmid, see the marker here, plasmid containing a gene of interest or a prophylactic protein. It can be a protein uh, which we are interested in. This gene is injected into the muscle tissue with that electroporotic needle. What happens there is the electrical stimulation permeabilizes the cell wall, DNA molecule and then access to the, has access to the cell wall nucleus, it goes inside, this gene goes inside the cells, the proteins are secreted inside the cells, protein encoded by the injected gene is produced by the cell, protein can be secreted or the protein can act intracellularly, so this both in these both cases the hormonal action on the target cell or vaccination through antigen is taking place and a immune cell is prepared or directly the hormonal action this acts on the uh, defective cells and the disease can be overcome so much like drug delivery this gene therapy method used to utilizes electroporation techniques which allows vectors to be introduced inside the human cells directly once incorporated into the cells of the body the protein produced from this gene can replace the defective uh, gene and thus a genetic disorder can be uh, treated. This is very promising area of research in medical and pharmaceutical microbiology. So these are the techniques which are employed for molecular cloning. Two more methods are there which we will see in our next lecture the liposome fusion method and the transduction method of using viruses. So in our next lecture we will be dealing with these two methodologies of molecular techniques in gene cloning. So I hope you are understanding these lectures which are very fascinating and they are directly applicable to the human benefits. Not only they have a huge potential market for the corporate world outside there but apart from that it also promises a better life for the humans. So as we go gradually one step higher as compared to the previous lecture, I hope you are moving one step towards becoming graduates and qualifying to do a postgraduate degree in microbiology. All the best for that. Study well, study hard. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to ask it to me, discuss with me in any form which you like. And also I request once again to go through the links which I have given down below for your preparation of notes and better understanding. All the best. Good luck. Thank you.